Thank you. I want to share with you my story, a quick story hopefully, on um, why my company, how I built that into be a social enterprise, and why I think it is an evolutionary idea whose time has come. Uh, my own story starts with starting my business back in the early 1980s and over the next 15 or so years I built it to be one of the larger IT support firms in Connecticut. Uh, then in the late 1990s I became a parent and as any of you who are parents here know it has a way of shifting your priorities. Um, it became more about wanting to uh, give back, to contribute, and not as much about what I could um, build and create in the, in the business world. And at the same time, unfortunately, we were reading an awful lot about what was going on in the business world, and a lot of it was pretty scary. The, you know, Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, names like that in the, in the news, there was an awful lot of intense greed, um, crazy stuff going on, lack of ethics, and it just started increasingly feeling to me as though it was a club to which I was not comfortable belonging. Uh, it didn't seem to me to be the, the people per se, it more appeared to be the model that was at hand. You had these people who were very competent, the best and the brightest in the business world. They were super competent, super competitive, uh, and they were told there is one single metric for success, and that's the money you make, the money you make for your company's bottom line. So is it any surprise that we end up where we, where we are today? And yet, at the same time, when I went back and looked at the early corporations that were out there, they didn't exist simply to make a profit. They needed to have a, a, a reason to be there, usually to create some kind of public good, like building a railroad or a bridge, uh, in order to get a corporate charter. This was a country that was built on people being really disturbed with things like the East India Company's monopoly over, over tea and the Boston Tea Party results. We wanted to hold our corporations in tight restraint. So when you got a corporation, you had to um, prove that you were going to be doing something good, and then you had an awful lot of restrictions on you. You couldn't cross state lines. You couldn't own shares in another corporation. Um, they were limits on the profitability that you could have in a lot of cases. Your lifespan as a corporation could be limited to building that bridge or that road, and then you were disbanded. And at the same time, the responsibilities that you had were enormous. You could be held financially, legally responsible for the actions of that corporation. So you fast forward to what we've got today. You've got corporations who have every bit the rights that you and I do as citizens. Uh, and, and very little of, of the responsibilities and profit, of course, is, is center stage. So you start to wonder what is going on here, and I realize these laws, these things that I felt were you know, immutable, like gravity, uh, aren't that at all. It's really just cultural conventions, that, that um, the business culture that's out there is not... Uh, is not a law. It is something that changes, does change, can change, will change over time, and it's simply up to us to figure out how we want to have it change and when. Um, when you start to look at some of the things that go on in the business culture, it starts to, to, to strike you, um, if, if you're like me, as a little bit strange, starting with the fact that there seems to be this feeling that profit has to be center stage. And if it wasn't originally, then does it really need to be that way today? Could we move in a different direction? We talk about shareholders being the owners of companies, but in, in, the, in the days where you could be put in jail for the responsibility of your corporation, I get that. But today's shareholders are investors, nothing more and nothing less. As investors, they do a return on their investment but they're not any, any different kind of investors than, than employees or the community in which a company thrives. Um, you take things like our statement of employees are our best assets, then why do they appear on the expense side of the ledger? That's a cultural convention. That's something that we've created. The uh, accounting structure is a, a convention, and we could change that if we wanted to. The way that we measure our our um, pluses and our minuses are incredibly important in terms of the end results. So the things that show up on the bottom line and the things that don't are, are significant. And so you take things like um, pollution, 
over over uh, fishing, deforestation, global warming. Those things are incred incredibly important to you and I, but they don't show up on the bottom line of a business, and we need to figure out how we can change that. Uh, and then there's the things that we say to ourselves that say a lot about what we think of ourselves and that particular convention. And I always get unnerved by the idea of nothing personal, it's just business. Because what is this all about other than personal? So one of the ways to sort of see how uh, a convention culture is uh, sort of getting off kilter is when you try to you know, apply the conventions of one culture onto another. So what if at home we sat around the dining room table and figured out who <laughs> had, you know, contributed the most to the bottom line and then divvied up the dinner <laughs> according? <laughs> or what if we were fine with shipping our kids overseas where maybe they could be raised a little more cost effectively? <laughs> What if it was okay to abandon your children if you couldn't afford both them and your second and third home? <laughs> and what if it was okay for your neighbor to come and dump their garbage over the fence into your yard? It seems ridiculous in, in our personal world, but that's what we do every day in the business world, and somehow we all accept that this makes sense. So for me, it wasn't making sense anymore, and I wanted to do something differently. I felt like I had three choices. I could get with a program, I could quit, I could, I could sell Walker, or I could do something differently. So what I decided to do was to take profit out of the center stage at, at Walker and my company and say, okay, we're not in business simply to make a profit. We're in business to make a contribution. So people count, our employees count, they're important investors in, in what we're all about, and our local and global community are also equally important. It's not to say that money isn't important, profitability it is important, because frankly if we don't have profits, we don't have money, there's not a lot of good stuff that we, uh, we can do. But what it does say is that people, purpose, planet, those things add up to uh, an equal or perhaps even a little more so than the, than the profitability side. And I realized that that's what social enterprise is all about. The definition for um, any of you who, who have heard the phrase but not aware of what it means, any organization that is structured to use um, the, the free market in order to accomplish a social benefit. And Social enterprise can come from either side of the spectrum. It can come from the nonprofit side where mission and purpose and making a contribution is already built into the DNA. They come to social enterprise in order to get sustainability, in order to have a way of making money so they don't have to go begging from donors. It can also come from the commercial side. Think Newman's Own or Tom's Shoes. These are organizations that know how to use the free market, but they want to have their company be more than just enriching the shareholders. They want to have it be about making a contribution. So what we did at our company was take profit out of the center of the picture and put the uh, shareholders uh, or all the investors uh, in the in the center, so the employees, the community, and the shareholders, and we said we wrote rewrote our articles of incorporation and our bylaws, and we said we are committed to being socially responsible. We are committed to transparency. We will share with our employers employees the finances of the company. We would get everybody involved in making decisions and be as democratic as possible and we would make sure that we have systems in place that will ensure that there is not this crazy discrepancy between high and low uh, compensations. And lastly, any of the profits that we have must be split equally between the employees, the community, and the shareholders. So all the investors win. Then the next thing was, because a lot of people would ask me, why are you writing your articles of incorporation and bylaws? You own the company, just do it the way you want to do it. But what I wanted to do was to come up with some kind of model, something that would then outlast me and become something that would move on to the next generation. Too many examples of companies that get a good thing going, then they sell the company and it's back to business as usual in a short order. So we wanted to come up with something that was going to protect it, and what we did was create a new class of stock, preferred class of stock. Doesn't give the holders of that stock 
any control over the company uh, for day-to-day -day operations, but it does give it con controlling vote over anything that has to do with the social enterprise status of the company. So if a new owner comes in and says they want to change it, they've got to get okay by the um, holders of the stock. And then we created a nonprofit called the Social Enterprise Trust that holds that stock. So they become the stewards of that stock. And if anybody new comes in and says they want to change it, because the mission of this Social Enterprise Trust is to promote, preserve, and protect social enterprise, the answer will be no unless it, it benefits everybody. Our goal is that hopefully we could provide that kind of stewardship for other companies, that we could um, have an easement on other companies who have owners who want to uh, leave a legacy beyond just simply their, their bottom line. We started an incubator called the Jive Hive, and our idea is to surround the new social enterprise, the social uh, entrepreneur, with the support they need, the services, uh, the space, the uh, funding that they need in order to have their, their ideas take wing. And, uh, and if we do this, we seed the world with organizations who are actually giving back rather than simply extracting. Are there going to be mistakes? You betcha. That's what evolution is all about. Hopefully we learn from the mistakes and, and we have enough positive stuff to keep going. The thing is, the publicly traded corporations can't help us in this. First of all, there's a lot to lose there in terms of money on, on their side, so they're not particularly interested in doing that and not a whole lot to gain except perhaps a soul. Um, <laughs> on, uh, but. Uh, what what we are hoping, and, and furthermore, with the with the large companies, they can't because they've got they went into the game as a um, uh, regular company, and so they have a financial fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to maximize profits. But if you uh, find that the next Microsoft, the next Google, if we can create those as a social enterprise and we build that into the DNA of that company and we protect it with something like the social enterprise trust, then look out because what you've got is a new species on the, on the horizon. You've got a new type of company where all of us as investors can choose where we want to invest. And for my part, I want to invest in the social enterprise because A, it feels good, and uh, B, I think long term it's going to be financially the right way to go as well. We all have a part to play in it. Um, and, and my ask of you is, first of all, to challenge the conventions that you see out there. Recognize that business is a cultural phenomenon. It can, will, does change over time. And it's up to us to decide when that's going to happen. To trust your heart and your gut. To know that these are finely honed tools. They've been honed by millions of years of evolution. And we need to learn to, to trust them. And when something feels funny, to start asking questions, to ask, why does it feel funny? And how could we be doing something differently? And what can we specifically do to uh, fix the situation? And if we all uh, take this kind of action, then someday, in the not too distant future, social enterprise could become the new business as usual. Uh, it seems like a revolutionary idea. At, at this moment in time, but I think there's going to be a moment where we look back on it and see it as an inevitable progression. Because as Martin Luther King said, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I would like to add that the arc of evolution seems long as well sometimes, but it does bend toward the light. Thank you. <laughs>